She tells me to tell you to shut up, but I think you're getting the message. <laughs> how was lunch? Great. Oh, how do you enjoy the show so far? Yes. Yes. Yes, you do. Good. Cool. All right. So, um, I may look like a hipster, but I know nothing about ponies. <laughs> but I enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm Jan. My name is Jan Leonard. I live in Berlin. Um, and since I can think, I've been on the web. So being invited to a conference called Web Rebels is really cool. Um, I, I would call my profession a web developer. And I do everything from databases to front end stuff and everything in between. And I would say my passion is to make your life easier. So whenever I build a tool that allows you to build something greater on top of it, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. So that's, that's me. Um, I hope you are people who build web technology and build things with web technology. I hope that's, I hope I think that's you. Um, if you've got any questions, if there's time at the end, and there won't be any time at the end for questions because I have a lot of material, but if there's time for questions at the end, we'll do the questionnaire, and there won't be any time. And if there's no time for questions, I'll be around for the conference, and there won't be any time for questions. So I'll be around, and you can just talk to me while I'm here. And if you think about a question when you were all back home, it's like, oh my god, I wish I had asked John that question. Uh, here's my email. Email me. I like receiving emails, please. And if you do the Twitter, you can follow me. I'm very, very boring, or funny, depending. Um, my talk, no wait, I'll go back. Before I start, um, I'd like again uh, to thank Drake and, and Bodil for inviting me here. Um, I, all I've ever heard from Web Rebels, that is an awesome conference. And like I've been here, was calculate, 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 maybe 16 hours, and it's already one of my favorite conferences. So thank you very much. I was looking for me also, uh, I have a slight coffee addiction. And oh yeah, my apologies to the sign language interpreters. Um, I'll be mumbling and speaking very fast and saying a lot of crazy things, so uh, good luck. <laughs> uh, my talk is called No Backend and Offline First, and this shouldn't make any sense to anyone here, um, but I hope to clear the mystery a little bit. Um, I'll start with a black slide. When you start out to do anything, and you're expecting a certain kind of success, there's a number of things you should be concerned about, you should take into consideration. And I'll pick two of them. And the first is, you should have your target audience in mind. If I were giving this talk in front of a group of sales executives, not a good idea. Um, so I'm giving, I hope you're all web developers, I think I talked to a bunch of you, so I think it's, it's the right fit. Um, if you do something and you don't have an audience, then you may be doing the wrong thing. So you can't have any success if you don't have anything or anyone that could use your stuff or whatever it is you're doing. Um, the other thing that's fundamental is work within real world constraints. If for my talk to work, I would have to ask you to get on your hoverboards and chase each other around the tables, not going to work. We don't have hoverboards. And there's two exceptions to this. The one is, Sometimes a genius comes up and like, that's the way we should do things and everybody, that's a crazy person. And a hundred years later, oh my God, that was a genius, he was totally right. That sometimes happens. I'm not a genius. I, probably nobody is a genius. Uh, so this is very, very rare, so this can't be a rule. And the other thing is um, uh, sometimes you're building things for a real world that isn't there yet, but you know it's going to be. And in computing, it's really easy. We have Moore's law. We know how computers get faster. We know roughly how batteries get more capacity. So we can, if we write software and we know it takes a year, we can kind of extrapolate what kind of hardware will be available when our software ships. So this isn't taking real world constraints into consideration, or it is kind of the future. Maybe it's timey wimey. I don't know. But th th these are the two things: taking your target audience and the real world, the real world into consideration. Now. <clears throat> With this preamble, I'm trying to find my mouse cursor here. Can you, can you do you see, is there a mouse thingy going on? It'd be really cool if I had this. There we go. Um, we as web developers, as technologists, as people who build web technology and use web technology, um, we are really bad at these two things. We don't do that. And web technology is successful despite that we're <laughs> 
not doing these things that I just talked about. So um, if I was, was an angry person on the internet, I would say we're doing it wrong. Um, but I'm a generally positive person, so I say we can do better. Um, and I'm not trying to advocate for a massive paradigm shift. I tried that before, it doesn't work. Um, so what, um, what I'm trying to do here is invite you to shift your perspective a little bit, just a little bit, to get a new perspective on how we do web technology. Um, and we can do better, we can make better technology, we can build better products, we can make ha users happier, we can make more money through better businesses and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we'll, I will go through two elaborate examples to, to make my case. Before I do so, I really like how the chairs make noise. I really, really like that. Thank you, Max. It's like a purring cat in my ears. I can make these noises, that's also good. Um, so, to help making my first point, I need to get my friend Gregor on stage. This is Gregor. At this age, he isn't supposed to walk. And by any standard of a kid being able to walk, like a five-year-old, or a teenager, or an adult, or a professional runner or walker, this isn't walking. But um, telling Gregor at that age you can't walk, he's like, fuck you, I've got my struts, I walk. This is good enough for me. Um, so this slide sums up my whole talk. This is the TLDR of this talk. Um, and the, the summary here is that a lesson that Gregor's mom told Gregor way back when, when somebody told you or tells you, hey, I want to do this crazy thing, and the people who are maybe in the position who can do that thing, the people who build the back ends for the front ends, you can't do that. That's too hard. It's impossible. Um, what you should do instead of accepting that is, what are the constraints they're basing their, their points on or their arguments on, and then question those constraints. And more often than not, you come up with solutions that aren't working within the constraints that these other people have because they're stupid, and you can just walk with a, bit, with a bunch of struts. And since Gregor's mom uh, taught Gregor that lesson, you better listen to Gregor's mom. Um, but this talk isn't about her, because she doesn't care about backends. This talk is about us, because we still care about backends. Um, but we shouldn't. I strongly and firmly believe that everybody who works in technology should work 100%, or like I think in general, should work 100% on things that they love, and because they're working on things that they love, they're good at it. Um, the things that people tend to love uh, in, in front ends, or in, 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 the, in the front side of the back web development stack, is um, that's, that's where the differentiation is, that that's where we delight people, that that's where we make good user experiences, that's where we add business value. The fact that you can send an email, pretty little value. The fact that it's really fun to send an email, <laughs> very good business value. That's very efficient to manage your email, hey Gmail, very, very good. The fact that it sends and receives email, that's kind of taking it's a given, it's not really interesting. But the, the power is in the front end. Um, so if you're a front end developer, if you, who is a front end developer here? All hands up, thank you. Cool. Um, you shouldn't worry about the back end because that's no fun, right? Who's a back end developer, by the way? A few, let me too. <laughs> but shh, I don't let him out today. <laughs> um, the good news is that 2013, this year, 2013 is the year that we all can stop thinking about the back end. <laughs> oh, you're so cool, thanks. Oh, amazing, okay, that was that. Maybe we, I hope you like this. So, um, to show what I mean, uh, does anyone know Chris Coyer? CSS Tricks, amazing guy. He comes up with all cool shit all over the place. I love him. Um, he did a thing, 2008 or 2009, uh, called uh, Editable Printable HTML Invoice. And what he did is he took a website and built an invoicing app. That's just an HTML table, a bunch, bunch of fields, a bit of JavaScript and CSS that looks good. It looks like an invoice, and you can edit all the things in there, um, <coughs> change the invoice number, add another item over here. Um, <coughs> it costs money, you put that in there, and boom, you have an invoice. And when you're done, you print it. You get the print dialog, and you print it out and send it to your client, and that's that. It's a full app. It's amazing. What 
this can't do, though, is you can't send the email from within the app. You can't have a list of your previous invoices. You can't open the invoice up on a different device. Um, you can't convert it to a PDF or a PNG. And all, those, all these sorts of things that you can't do with the context of a browser. When was the last time we, we, we asked, no, we, uh, we reconsidered the constraints of what you can do in a browser? <coughs> like we've been doing this for 20 years now. Um, Gregor and I and a bunch of friends, we've been thinking about this for the past year and a half. And, um, well, we want to, we want to, we want to make things a little bit, yeah, well, I want to show this. So we took the invoicing app in 2013, if I did it a little bit, so it has like a texture and buttons. Um, you can still do the things that you could before. Change everything, do the thing here, that was more expensive than we thought, we can put in another item here that we didn't consider before, that all works. Um, and that, that, that's cool. So the next thing we can do is like, show that that's actually persistent. So we're going to open up a new tab, timing, open a new tab, excellent, um, and see, boom, that's our invoice in a different tab, so we can open this up multiple times. That's actually nice. Um, the next thing we did, you notice a bunch of buttons on, down here. Um, we have a few more functions here. We can add a new invoice. We get an empty uh, form. We can fill that out. We can have another client or another invoice for the same client and, and add them stuff. We can get a list of our invoices that we had. We can switch between them and check them out. Uh, go back and forth, and we can delete them. Very easy. So this is OK, nice, but you can build this with local storage rather easily, like or something like local storage. This is not, not very fun. Now, on the bottom right, we create a sign-up button. Now, this is interesting. We get a sign-up form, but instead of filling that out, I'll show you what happens on the code side. Uh, here, uh, there's a JavaScript API that is account, sign up. Uh, we sign up with Gregor, because we like him so much. Um, and you can't spell his fucking name. Um, put in the, the secret password here, and boom, we're signed in as Gregor. That was that easy. How cool is that? And to prove that that actually works, we're opening Firefox. For anyone who still uses Firefox, we've got an empty app here. But um, we'll sign up as well. Wait for it, we'll sign in. Gregor, thanks for autocorrect, or autofill, one, two, three. Sign in. Sign in again, and boom, there's our invoices. We can uh, add a new invoice, it's a Firefox invoice here. We um, can do all the things that we used to be able to do. And we can go back to Chrome, reload, and see, boom, we've got the Firefox thing over here. So this is like, I opened it up on my iPad or whatever. So this is, user. you can log, log into this now. Um, so that's quite, quite nice, right? <coughs> so next thing we do, uh, we want to export this into a PDF or PNG or, and offer it for download over here. So instead of clicking on the thing, I'll show you the code again. We convert the, well, how would you convert a DOM to a PDF? What could that look like? Oh, convert some jQuery selector to an invoice PDF. That should do it, right? Why should we write any more code? Um, we can do a PNG as well. We can auto-detect the extension here if we wanted to. Um, and to make usable and sensible file names, we just put in the invoice number there as well, a kind of utility function that does that for us. Um, so that gives us the thing, uh, the conversion. But um, now that we've got that, we can offer it for download. Let's reformat a little bit so we can read it a little bit easier. And so when we're done with the conversion, we'll offer it for download. And once that runs, notice it's Chrome Console, we get it offered for download. This works. Like, this isn't just some bullshit. Um, so we just downloaded the file, and boom, there's the PNG, all from within your browser. Who told you last time you can't do this shit in a browser? Well, fuck these people. Um, um, there's a lot of complexity involved in this, the creating the user account, the, the uh, converting the DOM and everything. Um, but as an application programmer, we shouldn't have to worry about that complexity. That should be solved somewhere, but we shouldn't worry about it. Uh, one more example. Sending email. We have been able to send email from a browser for ages, right? Really easy. href, everybody's done the mail to, we put in the email address here, and our email client opens, and uh, we can send an email. We can even customize it, put in the subject line here. When I figured that out 10 years ago, my mind blew. But um, um, So this works as well, but that's not a user experience somebody, uh, anyone expects, right? Who's got a native email client installed these days? Um, so what we want to have instead, 
is and send email function. And we just want to pass it some JSON that describes our email. We have a subject, and we have a bit of utility code that does all the jQuery for us. We get the title down here. Uh, we get some text. We convert the, the invoice to the text here. And we want to send it to Gregor. So we'll, we'll type this in here as well. Um, that's one handsome company. So we send an email, boom, that should be sending an email. And while we're in there, um, we also want to send an HTML equivalent because like, we, we drew this nice HTML table. Why not send that in the email? It looks nicer, right? Actually, I'm a fan of plain text email, but go with me. <laughs> um, and now we, we're going to check out what that looks like in our, our email client, who I hope the network holds here. Oh, yeah, we've got a bunch of new emails over here. Um, this is our original plain text email. Looks OK, works for me. Um, you can have HTML emails as well a little bit later. Looks all nice, proper table. All the rest works from within the browser. Um, back to inbox zero. And one more thing. Um, since we already converted things to, to an image, why not attach that to the email? Because people want to file that or send that to their tax attorney or whatever. So we'll just open up a bunch of attachments here, or one in this case. Um, and we had conversion code earlier. We'll just you reuse that. Um, here, and we we'll convert the invoice sheet to the PNG and send that as an email with an attachment. And now, um, I really hope the network holds so the email sending works. Like I'm connected with the wire. This is a video. There's no networking going on. So the, um, it's going to take a while, though, because email is slow. Um, are we, we're going to wait for this. Do, 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 do. Eh, can squeak with the chest. Oh, no, there's the, uh, there's the email. And boom, we've got the HTML email over here. Still works. And further down, the attachment, which is the image. We can double click that. And we have preview over there. And uh, it shows us the image, all from within the browser. So <clears throat> isn't that cool? Is that cool? You like that? <laughs> all right. So um, um, let's go through how we build web apps today and have been forever. You have an idea like Chris had, and you build a static prototype like Chris did. And in Chris's case, the constraints with the, of, of the browser were good enough to ship the app. But in general, you build a prototype, and your team gets excited. Oh, really cool. We should build this. And then the prototype informs that we need accounts and emails and exporting and stuff. So we build the backend to do that. And then we build a REST API. Uh, that communicates with that back, uh, that communicates the back end with the front end, and then the front end people write some AJAX code and um, to communicate with the back end, and they have to worry about oh, whether that server is available at all, or it sends back some garbage, or what's the error, what's all the error conditions here. And <clears throat> once that is done, um, we can ship a free beta because we worked so hard to finally get this out. And well, fuck, people love this. And people like want to give us money for this, so we scramble and add more backend stuff. We have payments and maybe file uploads so people can put in their their company images in there. And then we can finally start making some money. Whew. That's a whole lot of work, but that's what we do. That's what every one of us does has been doing for 20 years. Um, if you change your perspective a little bit, and if you use the right mindset and the right tools, um, if you go to the right side a little bit. Um, you have an idea, and you come up with a static prototype. And because you don't worry about the backend, you don't have to worry about accounts and emails and backend and all that bullshit. You don't have to worry about defining a REST API that does the thing that you want, a really cleanly and semantic REST and whatever. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, writing jQuery calls or AJAX calls that, that worry about all the error conditions in your application. And you can go straight to income, money, yay! <laughs> so th this must be the easiest sell ever. Um, so. No, no backend is not a product, and no backend is not a project. You can't install no backend. No backend is an invitation to you for us to reconsider and reevaluate how we build web technology and with what mindset we build technology um, and figure out what we can do better. You all said you like the APIs. Why don't we have this? It's possible today. Why isn't this standard? Why do we still make REST calls? And I love REST, don't get me wrong, but not at this level. Um, Nobackend.org is the website that Gregor put together. It has all the information, <laughs> nice purpley. Um, uh, it explains this in a little bit more detail. It has a bunch of examples. Um, you can help out with things. And it shows a bunch of solutions as well. Uh, one of the things is remote storage. Anybody heard about remote storage? A few? It's like local storage, but remote. Duh. <laughs> 
uh, it's really it's a really boring in a very nice way that it does what it says on the tin. You can interact with a remote data store that's decoupled from the application or from any backend provider. One of the original motivations was to have a like you could have a social networking app like Facebook, but having Facebook not being in control of all the data. That kind of decoupling is built in here. So remote storage is pretty cool, and this is even uh, being drafted as an IETF standard. So this is pretty official pretty soon. Um, there's a thing called Firebase. Anybody heard that? Good. Proprietary backend and free front-end libraries. They even have, and it's really nice, really good, they have a bunch of users. They even have a JavaScript API that you can use. But we can do better, to say that nicely. I, think, I don't know if you can read this, but um, it's a, like, it gets the point across of what they're doing, but it's, like, it's very back-endy language. It is not as straightforward as the like, account sign up, boom. Do this. There's a thing called Meteor, most hands. This isn't really a no backend solution, uh, but I mention it anyway because they're also blending the front and the back ends together. Um, but they're kind of exposing back end thinking and back end uh, APIs to the front end and make them available there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this isn't really what we had in mind, but I thought I mentioned it anyway because you were going to ask. Um, and that's a thing called Kinvi, also again proprietary backend, and they focused on mobile first, but they also have an API for, 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 for web apps now. And just going quickly through here, this is a really nice, what do they say, onboarding experience. Sorry. You put in an email and a password, you put in a name for your app, and you select which one you have, and of course we're going to do the HTML5 one. Duh. Um, all we get is a script include over here that we put into our website, and boom, we can build Kinvi apps. And then Kinvi gives us a backend and shows us how many users have signed up, how many API calls there were. Um, this is all like out of the box. That's really cool. And then last but not least, it's a thing uh, that Gregor and myself and our friends Kaylin and Lena and Alex have been working on for the past year and a half, which learned, like, is, take, takes all these lessons together. It's a project called Hoodie. We claim we're very fast web development, web app development, and um, we're trying to convince you to use Hoodie because we have a crazy cool API, and all the stuff I showed you earlier is actually the Hoodie API. Managing account stuff is that easy in Hoodie. Creates the account, reset password, all that stuff over here. Uh, storing data, just a bunch of, like a very short API that you can store data, retrieve data, do stuff with it. Um, uh, hopefully very straightforward. School, 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 school. <laughs> Anyway, uh, you can get events on your data, so whenever anything happens in your data store, you can subscribe to it, so you have a very nice decoupled architecture here. Um, you can have remote events, local events, uh, you can synchronize with the backend with a remote, you can uh, share data, make it public and private, um, <clears throat> and you have a fully-fledged sharing API, kind of like Google Docs has, where like, this person has access, they can read their admin and no re revoke their admin rights and everything. This is all built into Hoodie, and the way the, the way we built this is we have a use case, we have an app, we want to do a thing, and we want to have a feature within this app. And then we think, what would be the nicest way to express the intent of that feature? Like, how easy should it be to grant read access or share a thing or further up sign up a user? And then we like, play around with this API a little bit and try out why it basically writing pseudocode, figuring out, okay, is this really good? And then, um, or maybe we can do it that way. Oh, if we, can do, if we do this, then we can combine this into that. No, no, that's too complicated because all these assumptions that we make, so we go back to the simpler one. And after a few iterations, we come up with, a, um, with an API that we're like, oh my God, oh my God, this is so cool. <laughs> what would be so great if I could just do that and it all worked magically? And then we can't help ourselves but implementing all the plumbing that's needed to make it work. Um, and that's the thing we call dream code. And that has nothing to do with hoodie or no backend. This is just the idea of that, like, what is the nicest way to, to, uh, to express your intent uh, of a certain thing? Um, and then you just write it down and iterate on it and then just use that for your application and make it work. And dream code isn't really a thing. Dream code is a verb. You should dream code. You should make it nice. You should, you should express what you really want and then make that work and not fight with rest bullshit and oh we got to do this over here because of reasons like you should make it really really nice over here and this may not be important for just you guys or a small group of people but if we do this as an industry where people who build web apps say hey i really want to do this and it should look like that and then a bunch of people disagree and agree and certainly finally we have a, this is how payments should be done this is a really concise API, how applications should use payments. Then we can build one or one of a bunch of solutions for that, and then people can just use it. And the solutions that you build 
if I give you an API that works really simply and is really nice and allows you to, to ship apps really quickly, this is worth money. Uh, so um, we should totally get into that scheme. Um, but I want to dream code with you a little bit. And dream code is always two things, kind of like BDD, behavior-driven development, where we have a statement, an intent, and then some code. Um, so I want to sign up for an account. I want to sign up function, username, password. I want to know when we're done, and I want to know when an error happened. Easy as that. Make sense? Cool. I want to reset my password. Oh, I've got to create this token, and it only has to be valid for a certain amount of time. Oh, wait, what's our security policy say about the amount of time that the token is available and then needs to be available on this private thing, and we need to check if it was leaked on some website. And Fuck all that. That's how reset password should look like. And we should take care of all of that in the somewhere else, but the application's intent is resetting the password, putting the email, everything else is taken care of. Because there's no, there's no fun, there's no business value, there's no nothing in the, how this is implemented. Um, if I want to save a new invoice, I have some data over here, just store it, done. If I want to share it, share a new invoice, I just pile it on, I share the thing, and then I display the public URL. Really easy. Um, <clears throat> if I want to export the current page to PDF, I can convert it, the document body, to an invoice PDF, and then offer it for download, expressing the intent of what we want to do. Um, I want to get the screenshot of a website, URL to PNG, download, done. It shouldn't be any harder. And this is actually one of my, one of my favorite examples, um, because in Chrome, you get access to the pixel buffer that is rendered, and you can convert it to a PNG and offer it for download without ever talking to the server. So the implementation is really easy. Uh, for our other browsers, you have to ship the DOM to the server, render it server-side, generate the PDF, and then send it back to the client. The API, I don't care. Like, whatever complexity is behind to make it work, it doesn't matter for the application. The only difference is that the other thing takes a little bit longer than the first one, but you have to figure out a good user experience of that. Um, purchasing stuff like, let's, let's, do, let's go business. Let's do this seriously. This is what the application should be doing. Purchase the product with that credit card. Of course, this needs to be implemented securely, and it can be. But this is all of the things. Uh, this is only like this is the only thing that the application uh, should be concerned with. Uh, I want to purchase with PayPal. Boom! Everybody hates PayPal, right? And in writing these integrations, that's what the PayPal integration should look like. Uh, I want to do upgrades. I have an account. I can upgrade it to Pro. But I want to pay for it, so I wrap it with a purchase. We can compose these things really, really nicely by writing good, good APIs to capture the intent of our features. And finally, the best one, I mentioned the coffee addiction. I have a device on the local network that makes coffee, and it wakes me up when I'm done. So I can literally dream code before that happens. So um, summing this up, <clears throat> question all the constraints. Like, Don't let them tell you you can't do this or this is impossible. Um, dream code. Dream big, like solve your problems, like make it work. Um, do not worry and uh, be happy. So this is the this concludes the no backend part of the talk. I hope I have conclusively shown you that we're not addressing the needs of application developers, and we can do better. And I can prove that we can do better because of working technical solutions of that. So I hope we can switch our thinking to considering the target audience here. The other one. Actually, I need to breathe. Oh. Let's call this intermission. Oh, yeah, please. Oh. Ah, nice. Cool. All right. Intermission done. <clears throat> the other part of the talk is questioning real-world constraints. And I call this offline first. Uh, by way of intro, who here knows the website Daring Fireball? Few people. He's a Mac nerd. Cool guy, actually, but he invented a blog post format called translation from PR speak to English. And it, the PR, like a press release, is written in English as well, but it's full of bullshit, usually. You know that. So he translates it to English. And he did one when, I think, uh, yeah, Adobe acquired Macromedia in 2005. And people have been copying this ever since <coughs> for things. So uh, I did in 2011 <laughs> uh, for a thing that Adobe CTO Kevin Lynch uh, posted the thing about multi-screen revolution, blah, blah, blah. Uh, lots of bullshit in there. And um, there is, this is a larger story about like, hey, here's like a flash app application building pipeline thingy we can deploy to mobile and pads and, and desktop all at the same time that never shipped because flash on mobile is dead. 
Um, so that didn't happen. And the larger point isn't really important, but there's, there's two quotes in there that like got me, I don't want to say angry, because I don't want to be the angry person on the internet, but uh, that uh, made me write this blog post. And the first thing is, wireless operators are already starting to roll this out, starting at speeds of 10 to 20 megabits. And the technology has the ability to ramp up to 50 to 100 megabits per second on a per user basis over the next several years. That would have been now. Of course, the speed will vary depending on which type of building the user is in and other factors. But generally, we can expect to see wireless bandwidth over time that's over five times faster than we're experiencing today. I translated this to, I don't know how mobile networks work because I ignore the fact that latency is even more important than bandwidth. Um, uh, who here remembers like satellite internet? Way back when you get like 10 megabits down and it's amazing for downloading. Well, um, but it takes 10 seconds to make a round trip to the satellite. So the actual user experience of like loading, downloading a lot of small files or trying to do other things that are a little more interactive, abysmal. It's like, it was really bad. Um, another example, who is a gamer? First person shooters on the internet kind of thing. You have real time collaboration stuff going on. There's always the, this kid that's played like twice as much as you. It's like half the age, twice as good. Like, does they make you sweat? Is that what gets you, oh my god, I can't deal with this? The thing that makes you sweat as a gamer is your ping. If the latency goes up, you're like, oh my god, oh, they're going to shoot me. Ah, damn it. That's what makes you sweat. The latency is more important than the bandwidth here. Um, <coughs> the, the other thing he said is, overall, it is going to be a plentiful bandwidth environment. And that's going to be great for anyone building experiences, such as streaming HD, video, multi-user games, and live collaboration on the web. And I translated this too we are going to make the web even slower. Because expecting all the big bandwidth will just sh shove more bytes down the pipe and build expectations for that, and nobody's prepared for that, so web is going to be slow. To understand where Kevin went wrong, we have to go back to the 80s, to a thing called the fallacies of distributed computing. Who has heard of these? Cool. They were invented or formulized by a bunch of really smart people who ended up founding Sun Microsystem in the 80s. Um, and these people are way smarter than I am. Um, and that's, that's what the 80s looked like. That was 30 years ago. And I'll just pick two of the fallacies. The network is always fast. Um, we already established that the speed of the network is less interesting than the latency. So um, that is taken care of really quickly. The next one is the network is always available. Um, so I took a plane over here, very little internet on the plane. I know there's people here who went on the plane that had Wi-Fi. Couple show of hands over there, over there. This is cool. This isn't, it's less about how we can technically make internet and networks available everywhere, but we tend only to do that way it makes financial sense. Like, if you're on a plane, you're bored, you pay shitloads of money to get web and internet access to go on your Facebook and do all the social things and upload your flickers from how you took a picture of the cockpit and whatever you do. Um, but the people who are in charge of building the networks, the telecommunication companies, they're just bloody greedy. Who here is not from Norway? Who here is happy with that data roaming situation? This is really hard to do in the Scandinavian countries because you actually have a very good situation. I'm glad nobody raised their hand, and please correct me if I'm wrong if anyone did. Uh, because they're fucking bastards. <laughs> um, so we, we, we don't have a financial incentive to build ubiquitous internet everywhere, and the people who are in charge have neither financial nor moral incentive to do so. Um, so um, we'll never be in a situation where we have ubiquitous high-speed internet anywhere. Um, and with infinite latency, I have no app, I have no users, people can't buy the things that I'm selling them, they can't use the service I'm selling them, they get upset, I lose business, we lose out as society. Um, this sucks. So this is the green slide, that means I have to tinker with the settings. I hope I get him sweaty now. So, um, should have done this before. Over here, over here, all right. I look good. Can you read this? That's the wrong browser. Can you read this? Nice. Let's reload this. Cool. It actually works. So uh, this is a simple to-do app, as you do. My web rebels. Um, if you want to indulge me, 
go to rtc-janl.jit.su and you can play with this. You can sign, you need to sign up for this. The username is test and the password is test, T-E-S-T. -E play with me, I hope you all got that. Um, so this is really nice, hi there. Get more, I can't type, more coffee, it's important. Um, and to show that this actually does work, I'll, I'll have the same thing open in a different browser. This may as well be my iPhone, uh, iPhone or iPad or other tablet. Um, so I see stuff happening up, uh, happening here as well, in sort of near real time. Why aren't you updating? So the internet's getting slow. Apologies. Well, actually, um, I'll turn I'll turn this off, and I'll go offline. Proof like. I'd, Wi-Fi is off, no thing, no nothing over here. So we see a few things here, and um, coffee is nice, I need cake, get some cake as well. Um, oh, and I'm on my iPhone, uh, I need to, um, what should I buy? Coke, okay, All right, so Coke over here. And I hope in the meantime you did a bunch of things over there as well, so I'll, um, maybe I was on the train and I went through the tunnel, and now I'm tunnels over and I'm back online. And let's wait a bit. Uh, Rainbow Dash is indeed the best pony. Coke, yes. Anyway, so uh, this is a world, world that we could live in where it doesn't really matter whether I'm connected or not and I can still use my applications. But wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I think you're very well trained in not answering rhetorical questions. Um, so before I explain how that works, um, and I know I'm running a little bit over time. My apologies. I have like, five, yeah, cool, excellent. Um, I'd like to invite you to think differently. Um, the, this doesn't usually work in web apps, right? And it doesn't work because we're making mistakes that's, that people have been making lists about that have a name, that are famous for having a name 30 years ago. We need absolutely need to stop making errors that are on lists that have a name that are famous for that, that are 30 years old. We need to stop doing that. Like, and I'd like to invite you to, again, shift your perspective a little bit and think about what we can do if we treat the web browser as a node in a distributed system as opposed to a client, a local cache, but something that has full capabilities to access and edit your data and synchronize to all the other points of the internet that you needed when the network is available. Um, so it should come to no surprise that the technology behind this, for this demo, I'm not saying this is the only technology that can do that, but certainly the coolest, uh, has to do with CouchDB. Who's heard about CouchDB? Ooh, anybody heard of PouchDB with a P? A few people, Dale is here. Uh, and TouchDB with a T? A few people? I know, but I won't, I won't yeah, they, they renamed it, but fuck that, this looks so nice. So to fix this, this is now like Couchbase Lite. Like almost oh, Lite is done, I call it TouchDB. So, so fuck the corporates. Um, the, the one thing you should take away from this section is to think of CouchDB as Git for your application data, and not in the... Thank you. I worked very hard on this. Um, not in the, I have a revision of data, I can rewrite the history and, and have, have uh, versions coming around, but the, the thing that's cool with Git, I work on a project and then uh, I want to show it to, to Max over here, and then he clones it and he has a full copy and oh, there's a bunch of bugs, I'll fix them to you, and he shows... Um, to Dale, and Dale goes, <clears throat> oh, there's a bunch more things that we can do here, and he pushes the fixes back to me, and I get Max and Dale's fixes all on my computer, and then I put it on GitHub, and then our CI server sees that and just runs our test suite against the software and decides, this is good software, we should ship it, so it puts it on production. And all over Git, the, having the data available where you need to do a certain computation on it, that, but for your application data, that's what CouchDB and TouchDB and PouchDB do for you. Um, uh, CouchDB is for uh, servers, it goes from Raspberry Pi to data centers and clusters, um, but there are certain environments where um, the, the CouchDB implementation isn't just feasible. For example, in a browser, that's where PouchDB comes in, thing with a P. It's written in JavaScript and targeted in mo mo modern mobile and desktop browsers. It implements that synchronization philosophy in your browser so you can treat 
your browser as a node in a distributed system. Um, and TouchDB is the same thing again for native mobile apps. There's a Java and an Objective-C version for iOS and Android, so you can have the same experience for mobile apps, and you can build your own iCloud that actually works. Um, if you don't have to or don't want to worry about the details of building a distributed database system with these tools, which I'm totally inviting you to do but it's because it's super fun nerdery, um, <clears throat> Uh, I invite you to check out Hoodies, this project you've never heard of before, um, <laughs> because aside from the having really nice APIs, we build in this offline first mentality in there. So Hoodie apps are offline by default, and you don't have to, it's like how you, you use these APIs, and they just use the offline first thinking and the implementation of that, and you can access cer th certain things of this and sharing and the remote events and everything, um, but you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about the details of building distributed systems. <coughs> So check out Hoodie. The last thing I want to talk about in this section is GitHub issues. You all know GitHub issues, right? I hope. If not, get on GitHub. It's really good. Um, how that happens to be Max. It's totally coincidental. And Gregor. Jesus Christ. Um, I love GitHub issues because when I'm on the issue page, if Max comments, it just the comment just pops up like in, in real time. So I can have a bit of a chat going on when we talk through a thing but I can configure GitHub to send me emails for all the issues and the comments going in there. So when I'm on the train or on the plane, I can queue up maybe 10 of them and reply to all the issues that happened, and they get sent when I get online after I landed. Um, and when they reach GitHub eventually and show up on the page for everybody who's watching live or looking later. So I have a real-time component, and I have an offline component. Uh, and this is a fantastic user experience. I don't have to worry about the network when I want to respond to an issue. I just reply to the email and use the fact that email is offline and asynchronous um, to work here. And there is an issue in the website that if you're on spotty mobile connection, it can happen that you post the same comment twice. Um, and there's things like item potence and good luck with that one, um, that help you solve this. Um, but the, the larger point here is that the field of distributed computing, which is kind of like, oh, this is, this, this is the hard stuff. Um, it has a whole tool set of things that are um, that show you how to do this. This really easy. Two minutes, uh, really easy. And there's a bunch of solutions, and we have a bunch of distributed systems that allow us to uh, that that work. That we can know this this theory actually does work. And in fact, distributed um, computing isn't actually hard. It is. Um, it's just not as common. It's like it isn't. The, the problems are definitely tough, but they're not tougher than garbage collection or malloc and free and all those things that we think of easy computing. Um, so I hope I show conclusively that we do not take real-world constraints into consideration when we build web apps, because we don't have a situation where we're all online all the time, and we will never have, for various reasons, a situation where we're all with plenty of bandwidth online all the time. Um, <clears throat> so I hope I have. Uh, conclusively shown that we don't do two important things that we need to do to have success, and it's a surprise, not really, but it's cool that web technology is successful anyway, but we can it way better, like an order of magnitude better and easier for people to build good applications by building things for the right target audience and having them in mind and um, building on uh, real-world constraints. I hope you enjoyed this. I did a lot. Thank you very much, Web Rebels. Thank you very much. <laughs>